Okay, so um, I'm hoping that everyone is inside. So if you're not inside, please let me know. Um, okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Raj Francis, and I'm an online learning designer at SILT. And I've been asked to, um, to chair this session, which is a presentation from different people at different, in four different projects that we have at SILT. So they're going to share with you the experiences on the project and tell you more about those projects. So first up in this um, in this session, we'll have Nawal Dean, who will be talking to us about the One Button Studio at SILT, which is a self-help recording studio that Nawal and the team has put together to help academics um, create their own online learning materials. But I'm going to let Nawal tell you more about that. OK, so as the video person that she is, she's prepared a video for us. So I'll just press play. Um, oh, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Hi, I'm the head of the digital media unit at SALT. And in 2016, I was tasked with project managing the construction of the One Button Studio, or the OBS as we currently refer to it. The OBS is an automated video recording venue that requires no technical skills on how to use a camera or audio equipment. The motivation for the OBS was to ensure that UCT academic staff have access to a high quality recording facility with minimal costs and create videos in a very short period of time that can easily be distributed to their students. Recording a video in this studio is as simple as pressing a button. This studio is set up in a similar way to the lecture recording venues. So how it works is, a presenter books a slot, which links and creates a video series in their Vula account. On arrival at the studio, the presenter can use the USB port to upload a PowerPoint presentation to the capture agent. The presenter can also use a script and upload it to the teleprompter. A studio manager will assist with putting on this mic and when the presenter is ready, the indicator light, which is now green, will turn red when the button is pressed to show that recording has begun. There is a monitor set up in front of the camera to read the script or to look at the PowerPoint. We can also plug in any device, laptop or iPad, into this HDMI socket to record a screen at the same time as the presenter is being recorded. This OBS is unique in that it integrates into the UCT learning management system via this capture agent. And the presenter can access these videos shortly after leaving the studio by logging into their Vula account. This aspect is the key to providing the entire video production process as well as a free editing system in OpenCast. Two. Welcome to the third and last lesson in Module 3. In 2017, we ran a pilot phase to work on the user experience of the studio. During this time, we managed to actually record and edit 60 videos for a fully online course with the accounting department. This taught us a lot. As you can see from this image, we had a very different background. The lighting and the position of the monitor was also very problematic. The feedback was that it was very hard not to look at the monitor under the camera as opposed to reading directly into the camera. This had a huge implication with the eyeline of the presenter. So we moved the monitor. Welcome back to the OBS studio. This is the green screen test with two people in it. The studio is limiting in its style. We can only record a maximum of two people in the screen. The background color can change from gray to green screen. The videos only differ in the distribution of them. An interesting and effective use of the OBS has been by the economics department who created concept videos in four African languages. The department wanted to test whether translating concepts will impact on the first year students' pass rates. They used the OBS for free before investing in a huge budget to create animated videos for these students. The 
OBS was used by a very technically advanced academic to record an entire MOOC in three days. He recorded and edited the MOOC by himself. But to give you some perspective why this is impressive is because normally it takes us around a month to record a MOOC and he only did it in three days. The lesson here is that if the academic is prepared and knows exactly what he or she wants to do in the studio, then recording a MOOC in three days is very possible. How to make a few simple plots with a plot package? In the past, if we wanted to record a screencast, we would need to record on a laptop without having the option of the presenter being on screen. Currently, we are working on a new formal online course where the presenters are using laptops to talk to texts from journal articles. In the past, we would need to recreate those texts in a PowerPoint and slot it into the video afterwards. This also means that a presenter can use anything on the internet or on their screens and record themselves while talking about it. Another usage has been to record revision videos for lecturers who have very little time but need to revise questions for TUTs. This is a quick and easy way to capture videos and have it available in Vula within a day. But our claim to fame is that the OBS has stepped up in dealing with the impact of load shedding. Academics have used the OBS to come in before a lecturing class is going to be cancelled due to load shedding and record this lecture and give it to their students on the day. This means the impact of load shedding on learning and teaching in the entire university can be minimized. So interesting enough, this studio has become the catalyst where the debate around going online manifests. The videos are a very small aspect of the work required to go online. I always say to any academic walking into the OBS, think about the studio like you are hiring a car. Where you drive the car, how you drive the car and who is with you on this journey needs to be decided before you even get into the car. I'm now available for questions. Thank you. Like having to watch yourself is the hardest part, I think. <laughs> Going online and blended, I think I do this for myself so that when I deal with that academic, I know the vulnerability and how hard it is. And then you have to sit here watching yourself. So I hope that um, I'm not too sure if I'm better in person or in real life uh, or on screen. And that's also what academics have to figure out. Can you translate what you do on screen into the classroom and vice versa? So I'm just open up for questions. So we have, um, we have a sort of marketing strategy where initially when we launched the OBS, we sent out like 400 free vouchers for the academics to come and play in the room. And we find that academics who have really gone online and have done MOOCs are really like, you know, the academic on, on screen that was just really good at it. And those that haven't done it before are a little bit nervous. So the training is not as formal as what I, um, you know, it's not a formal process of like stand, yes, smile. It's basically allowing each individual to experience what they need to experience and feel the room out and then understand what content they're bringing into the space. So we do always advise, please book a, a few slots just to practice and to play so that you don't feel like there's pressure. Anyone else? So we can generate subtitles um, if we want to, but the OBS doesn't do that in itself. I mean, we normally use YouTube, but if you want to edit yourself and you want to generate uh, subtitles, that's a whole other like layer. We also have Away With Words, which transcribes the entire OBS scripts. If somebody hasn't got a script, you have, an access, you have access to doing that. And Stephen can talk to you about it, but it's also, it's a paid for service. So, yeah, we find a transcription is, if you write the script and you have it on the teleprompter and then you want to slot that in afterwards in text, you can do that as an editor. But that's, a, that's another layer of editing that we sort of, we provide, but at a paid for service. Do you provide green screen editing to the lectures? Yes, we do, but the OBS in itself doesn't do that yet. We're still developing it. 
Um, so we, we take that on in terms of my team. Otherwise, we'll be replaced by buttons, and there really isn't anything that we can do as a job anymore. <laughs> just kidding. And, uh, just kidding. Just kidding. Do you, do you, it's not available for students, and are you planning to make it available for students? So that's a higher decision, but at the moment it's for academics, because also by the nature of where the OBS is placed, it's at SALT, um, at our offices, and it's really small. So um, we, if we do build more, it would be um, in a bigger space. So just the geography and the location of it at the moment is limited. But we, it was put out and funded for academics. And um, how do you do the booking? What, what software do you use booking? So we just use Outlook calendar, and it's booked as a room. And then you just receive an email notification. So it's really simple. I mean, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. And all our academics are used to using Outlook anyway. And then Outlook is linked um, in the back end to create, when you book it, it will cre automatically create the video series in your Vula account. That's, that's really interesting. We also have a, um, we only have the option when it comes to your flash drive. But uh, yes. so how does it work that it gets onto Vula? So there's an entire open source <laughs> wireframe platform. Which question. Kune, the genius behind it. I mean, I just literally put up cameras. No, I'm not kidding. We both worked on it to the extent that, yeah. If it's a real technical. Okay, so what we have is we've got a. Um, uh, by the way, I'm not a programmer. So okay, <laughs> no, it's, it's going to be quite simple. Um, we have a web service that basically pulls the booking information from Outlook, right? And then it creates a series, like a tool, in your Vula account, in your Sakai, okay? And that's linked to Opencast. So when you do a recording, it just sends the video to Opencast, it gets processed, and it shows up in your, um, in your tool, like a normal video would do. And then you can edit it, and you can publish it to any of your other course sites. Yeah, it's it's published in your personal video series. But nobody else can see your badge, yeah. so you basically can <laughs> clean it up and then down it, download it yes. when you want to, or publish it when you want to. But the idea is, as a video production, one of the biggest issues is processing, in uh, processing video and also editing video. So it's you know the reason why we we integrated the system was because. For me as a video producer, I feel like you can't just give somebody you know, a video on a flash disk when they haven't actually thought about how am I going to process and edit and change that video up. And also the timing in which it takes for them to do that. By the time they get, depending on the amount of lecture recording happening on campus, it would take about an hour for them to get that video into their Vula account and they could see it and then they could edit it themselves. We, we've created videos and modules on how to edit how to book, how to use the OBS. You know, we also have a, a studio manager that can support them. So it's to provide that full turnkey because it's very difficult, I think, for academics, apart from just going online and understanding the content and presenting themselves, to actually figure out now a whole other technical process that, you know, is a skill set. So the integration is a very important part. So that's also in the player, in the Opencast player that's linked. We have the download options. You can have a picture in a picture. So you can have the presenter download himself into a small little corner with the slides, or, you, or the student can actually just watch it on Vula and, and switch between the presentation and the presenter. So that actually cuts down editing time for us. As a formal editor, to slot stuff in and to try and align it takes a lot, much longer. So that's why actually the OBS has managed to cut down a lot of our time, costs, and resources in, in editing videos. And that switching between screens, that's smoothly, that happens smoothly of the Yeah. It's got nothing, it's actually got nothing, it's the system that it's built on, it's the open cast player. Yeah, we do lose a little bit of the audio, um, sort of the level of, you know, just recording to the camera by going through the capture agent, but it's so minimal. I shot this entire video and recorded it in the OBS. Okay. 
So if you look at it, it's really like, I mean, the level is, is quite high. Um, so we don't seem to have that problem, but I find that now with a lot of online courses that we're doing, I suggest that we just record it in the OBS because we have that interactivity of, watch, of looking at different screens and understanding how to use that screen as an audience. And the audience and the viewer has more control over that. So. So we have the former one that we do externally from the OBS is the Adobe Premiere, but this one's based on what OpenCast already has, which is very rudimental. It's cut, you know, it's just cleaning up on either side. You can't really like slot in things. You can only slot in something afterwards if you export it. But it's a, I mean, for an academic who just wants to get his video, their video out there, it's very easy. It's just about slotting in slides and cutting. Is there, is there one more burning question? You can speak to me afterwards as well. I'm very, I'm available. Just want to mention, so you can also then save it while it's going to your subscriber account, you also save it on a USB. Yes, you can if you want. Okay, thank you so much, Noel. Thank you, Noel. Um, so our next presentation is going to be by um, Mary and Fife and Tasneem Jaffa, um, who are online learning designers at SILT. And um, they're going to talk to you about what they've learned through um, creating, what's it, 18 different MOOCs since 2014 at SILT. So they will talk to you about the different learning design principles that they've come across and what's important for them when designing MOOCs. Um, thank you, Mary Ann and We may as well start in the meantime. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Mary Ann Fife, and this is my colleague Tasneem. We are online learning designers and project coordinators at SILT. And today we're going to share with you um, some of the principles that we've developed in <coughs> developing online courses at SILT. And I just want to say before we start that it's not a comprehensive list of principles, but it's more of um, it's more of a distillation of some of the themes that have cropped up in us developing online courses. So just to give you a bit of background, sorry. Just to give you a bit of background, this is a snapshot of a roadmap of where we are in our focus of developing online courses over the last few years and going into the future. So in 2014, we initiated the, um, the Vice Chancellor's massive open online course project, the MOOC project, and that ran until 2018, so last year. And um, that was when we launched our 12th MOOC, that signified the end of the project. So we're still involved in developing MOOCs, but um, the MOOCs that we're developing is outside the scope of that project. So our focus has shifted slightly to, from developing MOOCs to developing formal um, online and blended courses. That's what we're currently busy with in 2018, and we will be till at least um, 2021. Oops. Okay, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about the MOOCs project, but these are the courses, the, the MOOCs that we created. Um, you can see there are a range of different topics, so from um, 
from biostatistics and climate sciences to education and humanities and um, all sorts of different courses. Um, and the courses in blue are the ones that sit on the Coursera platform. You can see that's the majority of the courses. And then those are pink, there are a few. Those are the ones on FutureLearn. Okay, so um, these are the five principles that we are going to be unpacking today. And they are collaboration, quality, experimentation, academic ownership, and openness. And just to clarify, these are the principles that sort of emerged while we were busy with the MOOCs project. Um, and principles that we take with us to the to the us working in the formal open, open in the formal um, online space. Okay. Hi everyone. So the first one I want to talk about is collaboration. So when I think about our department salt, and we have quite a few salters in the audience. If uh, we are super collaborative, and it's at the core of everything we do, uh, every, every salt person in this room I have worked with to some degree. Um, yeah, so it's very foundational what we do, um, and we work together to achieve a common goal. So I would say one of the biggest outcomes of being collaborative is creating a quality product, or at least the, to the best of our ability and um, who's available in our team and the resource that we have. So uh, the the cool thing about co being collaborative is that it brings together different um, sets of expertise and different perspectives. So you're really trying to encompass um, different people's skills because we, we have um, academics that have been in the department for like probably 20 years to people who have worked there for a year. Uh, so the thing about being collaborative, there are implications and challenges that come with being collaborative. So one is being cost and time. So if one person disagrees, you do have to work together to find a consensus on being collaborative and um, sort of a common outcome. So this is just a little snapshot of some of the people we've worked with. So, so these are the lead academics of the MOOCs that we've created, the UCT academics that we've created so far. But what you don't see is us, the learning designers, um, the course managers, the academic assistants, um, people proving where we can film. So um, for me, it really takes a village to build a MOOC and also an online course. Um, so just to cover some of the tools we use to be collaborative. So we're still trying tools out and we're still working on achieving what works best for us. But one tool that we, we try to use is something called Asana, which some of you may use, which is a project management tool and a task manager. Another tool we use, and this is like the holy grail of collaboration, is Google Drive. So when load chain happens, we don't have access to Google Drive, and we all die a little bit inside, and we can't do our work. So this is like essential to everything that we do, and I don't think we would survive without it. Um, another tool that we use, so this is called Frame, um, and it's a video collaboration tool. So once a video is edited by Noel's department, then we go on Frame, and the learning designers, the academics, the course assistants can have a discussion about what is happening in the video and come up with a consensus on what to do for changes. And this also um, relates to quality, which Marianne will talk about later. Okay, so we, we can't really separate the concepts of quality and collaboration because we need to be we need to collaborate in order to produce any sort of quality product. And this mainly comes down to um, the communication and the teamwork between the core course team. And when I say the core course team, I mean mainly um, the academic team, us as the learning designers, um, and the video producers and, and the graphic designers. And we work together to towards developing a common vision, and as Tasneem mentioned, we need tools to be able to work towards those, that common vision. Um, and there are different ways of defining quality, but for the purposes of this presentation, um, we really, when we talk about quality, we really think about the pedagogical cohesion of the course, so the course development and the course design the academic integrity of the content and the accuracy, and then also the, uh, the production quality, so the technical quality of the assets that we produce. And this includes videos as well as other assets that we produce. And then, thank you. <laughs> 
So quality, we don't see as a separate step. Quality is embedded throughout the process of, um, of the course development. So it comes in during the pre-production, the post-production, um, or during the pre-production, the production, the post-production. Then we do allow for a separate um, phase called quality assurance or quality review. And then once the course is launched, we also do a quality review post production as well. So in the pre-production phase, we are concerned mainly with the, with the pedagogical quality of the course. So we work mainly with the academic team. We work with the video producers and the production team as well. But we work mainly with the academic team to define the vision for the course and help them to define the vision. Um, and also what the definition of quality is for this course, because from project to, par from project, to project, this definition of quality might vary. Um, and what that process might typically look like is that we, during the pre-production phase, will work with the academics um, in a, storyboard a series of storyboarding workshops um, or learning design workshops, and this is what it, the process looks like sometimes. Um, that's some of our learning designers and academics working together to create the vision for the course and translate that vision that they have in their minds into a product. Then during the production phase, our focus of quality shifts slightly. So now we've got the pedagogical quality or the um, cohesion somewhat mapped, and we want to shift focus to the academic content and um, the academic integrity of the, of the content and the production quality. So during this phase, we work both, so equally with the academics and with the video production team. And um, we see our role a lot as mediating between the academics, so their vision that we've created in the pre-production process, uh, the learning design team, and then also the video producers and graphic designers to work towards that common vision that we would have developed in the beginning. So it's very much a, a relationship of mediating those or a, a question of mediating those relationships. And this is just one example of how we, the tools that we used as Tasneem showed you, the tool frame allows us to have all the whole course teams, so the learning designers, the video producers, and the academics to comment directly on the video. Um, then at the end of the production process, before the course launches, we also implement a quality um, review process, and that review process will be done mainly by um, people who are outside of the core team, but they have some interest in the course. So they may be uh, members of the target audience or people who have knowledge of the academic content. Um, and this is just how we document that process in Google Drive. And we also, after the course is launched, we'll do a three-month review that's in the MOOC process, but all these processes we try to implement as much as possible in the formal online space as well. Cool, so yeah, we bit over time, just a little bit. <laughs> okay, next up, experimentation. So the cool thing about the MOOC space is that we got to experiment. So it was, I think UCT's like first going online course, so we got to try a whole bunch of new things. So. The thing you'll see about the experimentation principle is that it's not one size fits all and everyone has unique needs for their course and their discipline and also academic needs. Okay, so this is just a sample of what we do before we go into video editing, which is a style guide to get the look and feel of a course. And each course, like I said, is unique. This is um, four different courses and they all look different. Um, this is Noel showing how the light board works, but we have this glass thing. I'm explaining it very badly. We have glass, we write the Lumo markers, and then in post-production, they flip it around so you can read it left to right. Um, this is an example of some interviews we did, so the, we call these location shoots. Um, the top left uh, was a course on organ donation, so the, the guy wanted to, the academic wanted to make a reenactment of someone um, who, 
is experiencing, experiencing a brain dead person um, before they do the organ donation process. This is Mark Soms, and for his online co course, he did a weekly Q&A with questions that learners asked from around the world. And this is an example of a live YouTube session for a course on innovative finance. Academic ownership. So the fourth principle that we're going to speak to is academic ownership, and this one is perhaps more realistic than idealistic. Um, and although we do a lot of facilitation with academics to work with them to try and develop a common vision, sometimes we don't have a common vision. And sometimes um, the, the academic has a very clear idea for what they want to do, and not often, but sometimes it goes against what we might have advised. Um, and so what do we do in these circumstances? Um, the answer is that we, we, um, we stick to, I mean, it, it's academics product at the end of the day. So we recognize our role as facilitators, we facilitate the process, we provide advice, but at the end of the day, it's the academics product, it's their image, their name that is attached to the course. And this is even more important um, in the formal online space than it is in the MOOCs project. Um, um, so the academics, um, challenges that we experience is that academics have um, time constraints, um, they have different levels of involvement um, with the course, and um, academics are always very busy people. So what we have done to address those challenges in the MOOC program, we insist that, that, academ that academics like elect a representative to help them to um, develop the course. So these, these people would be junior academics who assist the academics. And in the formal online space, we um, academics, it's not that much of an issue because, because academics are generally more involved in the course. They see it as their baby, it's their bread and butter, it's their core business. Um, but if needs be, if it's required, then we um, do consider providing buyout for the academics time because um, to allow them to focus um, on the development of the course. Super quickly, the last principle, which is openness. So the cool thing about the MOOCs project is that everything is open. So everything is under a Creative Commons license because we want people to share our knowledge and share the things we've created and put tons of hours into. So we have had cases where people are using our videos around the world and they're running facilitated sessions on the weekends doing an entire six-week MOOC. So the, the thing about the, uh, our materials being open, it's not just the course itself, it's the videos, like the, the assets in the, in the course, so the videos, the transcripts, the images, the assessments, you can really use what you want as long as you attribute us. So one challenge I'll do super quickly. So because we're from South Africa, we also want to depict our market and creating a course from an emerging market. So if you search for good quality photos from South Africa, you sort of get this a little bit. Not quite, but it's hard to find super good quality images for what we want to create. So some, a lot of the time we have to take photos ourselves or um, create um, graphics to accompany our content. So these are just some of the principles, they're not everything, and as time goes on and we, work, we continue working on our online courses, more principles will emerge. And there probably is no time for questions. Um, Find out. Yeah, you went, you did go a little bit over, but we'll forgive you. There's a outside if you want to see what we do. Okay. Maybe one or two burning questions before we, we move on to the next presentation. Um, yes?
Okay. Thank you very much, Tasneem and Mary Ann. <laughs> no. You can see there was a lot that you, a lot of knowledge that you had to share with us from a, a long, a long project. So thank you so much for that presentation. Um, up next we'll have um, Michelle Williams, um, who will talk to us about Wilmers. Yeah, there was a typo. Oh, there's a typo. Sorry, <laughs> Michelle Wilmers, who will come talk to us about the digital online textbooks project. Thank you. Will you please tell me when I'm in ten minutes? Yeah, I will. So I'll show you five minutes, and then I'll show you. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm Michelle. I'm the Publishing and Implementation Manager of a relatively new project in SILT, which we have short-handed dot for de um, dot for de comes in the wake of a lot of other open initiatives in SILT around open educational resources, um, open scholarship, etc. And it's a relatively new project. We're about six months, just over six months into the work. Um, also, just to acknowledge our funders, the Canadian IDRC, who have been with us on, uh, a, for a large part of the SILT journey, of various SILT open uh, research, implementation, and advocacy initiatives. So one of the, the primary imperatives of our project is arriving at an operational definition of what it is that we think and we mean when we talk about open textbooks. We have for a while been watching the international space around open textbook development, largely based in the United States and Canada. There are a few institutions that have positioned themselves as open textbook publishers. We watch that space very keenly, but we're very interested in getting a sense of what do open textbooks mean for us here. So that's why a definition that we can work with it feels really important. And as part of that, we also want to get a sense of how might open textbooks in our context look or feel different to how they might in a North American or a Canadian context. So this is a movable feast. At the moment, we're thinking of these, these resources, these objects as scaffolded teaching and learning contents. The idea of an open license, implicit, so we want legally and technically open, on platforms or in various formats, formats that provide affordances for content delivery on a range of devices, um, integration of multimedia, and incorporation of content from various sources through collaborative authorship models. The collaboration piece is intrinsically important to us um, because in our environment, we're looking at this through an intrinsic social justice lens. So we're interested not only in the issues around mitigating cost, but also in terms of what open textbooks could mean for a broader voice and representation from an epistemological view. So open pedagogical approaches, and so the idea of student voice being incorporated is intrinsic. We have a, a relatively lofty overall objective of the project, and that is to contribute to a broader social justice agenda in South African higher education. Um, I've, I've touched on this already, but just to say that um, uh, I think a prompt for this institutionally was this, the student protests that took place across all of our universities in South Africa from 2016 onwards, and people have for a while had a sense that open textbooks could help us grapple with some of the curriculum transformation issues that we face at UCT and beyond. The, the project has three pillars or strands, if you like, which all speak to each other, uh, a research component, and then we have, uh, for, through our funding mechanism, uh, an amount of money which was made, made available for grants, and then there's an advocacy stream as well. So, just to say something brief about the research process, one of the first things that we did was a situational analysis to get a sense of what open textbook publishing is already taking place at UCT. And from this exercise, we surfaced 29 instances of open textbook development happening across the institution. 
I think this is an important part because often academics are already doing something and the institution comes relatively, not late to the party, but it's not like we're inventing the concept from scratch. We know that we have champions, many of whom were OER champions or champions of other forms of openness, who have moved into the open textbook development space because they were frustrated because half of the kids in the class couldn't afford a textbook or that they were working with materials that felt inappropriate for a local context. So in giving our grants, um, we worked with a, a very robust framework in terms of trying to get to our intersectional social justice approach and the partners we were working with, looking at uh, evidence of curriculum transformation in proposals, multilingualism, inclusion of student voices, and then also various forms of innovation, whether that be technological or pedagogical. And so from uh, our call for grants, which, from which we received 17 proposals, we were able to give nine grants, um, which it just so happened that when we evaluated the grants against our criteria, we got a nice disciplinary spread. And so from these nine open textbook development projects, we aim to be able to tell stories about the models that are being used to collaboratively author content, uh, what the sustainability approaches are, and what the collaborative approaches may be. We're also trying to get a sense of what is the, the life cycle of activities that are involved within the work, in part because we know that some of these areas of activity cost money. So we need, if we're thinking seriously about sustainability, where does, where's the money going to come from? Secondly, we also are involved in the constant ongoing conversation about reward and recognition systems in the university. If, the, if we're opening up a new cycle of work with academics acting as publishers in themselves, what does that mean in terms of their time and the areas of activity which need to be recognized and rewarded by the institution? And so within our advocacy work, as you can get a sense from these models and these stories, give us a sense of the institutional conversations that we need to have. And a lot of this is going to resonate for you, I think, in multiple other areas of work. It's about time, and so promotion, reward and recognition systems, issues of quality assurance, what does that mean in an open textbook development model, what infrastructure is required in terms of tools and platforms, and then what are the sustainability models? And just to park this, this imperative around sustainability, one of the great value propositions of open textbook development is that it's not static and a once-off, ideally. The idea is to use tools that en enable iterative, ongoing development. Nice principle, but what does that mean if you've put all the effort into doing it once? Do you have to do it again next year? And what are the implications in terms of time? Um, from our stories that we're looking at, we're also interested to get a sense of this, this entire constellation of tools and technologies that we see academics are already using. And this is just a snapshot of some of the tools, platforms, etc., the people who we are working with are using. Um, we're relatively agnostic at the moment. We're not advocating a specific approach. We're trying to get a sense of what people are doing and what works for them. Um, as you can imagine, a little bit tricky when people are using so many approaches and different tools and platforms to think about what institutional support means um, because it's so varied. But we do know um, that in terms of the Vula piece sitting in the middle, um, Everybody unanimously seems to want to have an ambition to link what they're doing into the Vula space because that's where they're running their assessments from or they're just heavily invested in that domain. And a final worth, uh, word just to say on, an, on a question or the issue of desire paths, um, I think institutionally as we grapple with what this means for us and the affordances of the new approaches around open textbook development, what we want is we don't want to squash the innovation. And so we, we navigate this interesting space between wanting to provide institutional support while still celebrating and advancing the, the individual initiative that's going on in this space. That's it for me. Open to any questions. Uh, 
Um, uh, so I, I can, and I didn't think to include a link to this, but I, the, the spreadsheet of that baseline situational analysis is publicly available as an open Google Doc. So if you Googled and you, saw, you searched for .4D baseline study, you should come up with it. Otherwise, I'll chat you afterwards and I'll, s I'll send you the link. We did make that spreadsheet openly available. Any other questions? On the, on the point of examples, the other ambition behind the grant initiative is to be able to have uh, ultimately a UCT collection that we can, if you did want to get a sense of what open textbook development is happening at UCT, the idea of an aggregated list somewhere that you could click through. Because obviously the ambition is for the resources to be utilized beyond the institution as well. Yes. Um, links between the open textbook and some of your other open projects. Uh, are people exploring that or is it, is it just that is the focus? Uh, do you mean in terms of the academics themselves yes. who are, are producing the work? Yes. Um, as, as I've said, I, I think there's an there's a affinity for openness amongst a lot of the academics who are doing the work. We didn't create that or have to sell that to them in any way. So I think the, the link is, is about practice. And, and that's the other thing that we're really interested in is open practice itself rather than just the tools. Yes. And so I think the open practice is actually the link for many academics and it will find its way out um, through whatever is the ambition or imperative at the time. And, and I suppose my question is how are you facilitating that open practice? So, so I mean, MOOCs would be an example of some kind of open practice. Yes. Uh, this would be another one. Are you kind of as salt scaffolding that openness as well or is that the academic response? Uh, so I don't want to speak on behalf of the whole of SILT, but certainly in terms of the, the, the projects which are running, there is a concerted drive towards promoting openness, uh, doing work with academics around um, education, around licensing, etc. And I think that's common to all, all the projects within SILT, if that really answers your question. Okay, and then our final um, presentation in the session will be presented by Sam Lee Pan, um, and she will talk about the online assessment tools and services, or technology services project, or we call it the OATS project, um, and so, thank you, Sam. First time properly using the lapel. Um, so I'm presenting this on behalf of a team. So a lot of this work has been done by my colleagues there in the audience. So Sita Jackson, Suraj, um, Stephen, and Sakena um, have all been involved in this project. And um, we have the provisional, the the first draft of the report available via that bit.ly link. So um, any of the details and such you'll find in there. So the background to this project was, um, it was linked to, it's partly linked to what uh, Marianne alluded to, our formal um, online courses that we are working on. And also some of you might have um, heard, but We've used ProctorU in the past, and that was partly linked to student protests and disruptions and exams having to go um, uh, for certain situations online. And we wanted to approach this and the relationships in terms of what online services and proctoring offerings are more systematically. And so we're kind of using this time and space and this um, this project started around the end of last year. We've been looking at quite a lot of the vendor services that are available. So, so the first thing that we started off with was, was um, looking at 
what is currently happening with UCT academics. Um, and we sent out a survey, uh, and there was 144 responses um, from across a range of faculties. And um, there was, we in the survey we outlined, there were three main distinctions. So you have your exam-based conditions, which are either paper-based or online. And then you have your non-invigilated summative assessments, so your take-home assessments or portfolios, and then your practical-based exams. So the question that we were probing was whether, uh, what, how does this relate to your current practice, and w what would you see yourself doing in the future, or would you like to do in the future? And um, as you can see, the most things are paper-based currently, so academics could f complete more than one response. So I've also included how many responded, particularly for the online exams, because that's what we actually, the space that we're watching in this case. But the, um, the paper-based was the majority, and um, we still did have quite a good, well, somewhat of a representation in the online exams, and that would have been more in computer lab-based exams, like in health sciences, there's quite a lot of work in that. And then on this side, in the future analysis, there was basically a, lo a move and a, lo a lot larger um, amount of people that responded to that, um, but yet only half, so 120 people responded to the, f the current practice and 60 respondents responded to the future practice. So you can see that some people are still uncertain about what they want to do the, in the future or maybe they'll just continue as per usual. So then the next section that we looked at was looking at the range of services and trying to categorize those into understandable blocks. So some of you might be familiar with this um, a responders lockdown browser, which is basically when you start the assessment from your LMS, it will it will lock down everything, so not allow you to other applications and resources. So that was the first type of category, um, and then the second category was this remote or human proctoring, which so proctor you for example, where you'd have a webcam and essentially if you think about a Skype session, but in a more systematic um, manner that they, a, a proctor would connect to you remotely and watch you to ensure that you don't um, cheat or do anything, um, access any re resources that you shouldn't do during that exam. And then the third one is something that's quite emergent and also a changing space is the automated online proctoring. So the automated online proctoring is um, partly algorithm based also because it will record your session and then they would screen for any types of factors where they consider something to be like deviant behavior, like moving outside the camera view. Um, and the last one is a new, new section that's also just focusing on the verification. So identifying that person is the person that is starting the exam and is doing the exam. So some of you we might, be in, might have been in contact um, with and we've actually try to list and scan to see what different institutions are using. So um, I've included a link to the report again. So if you find that your institution is not listed yet or something is incorrect, please add a comment there. Um, but we kind of started engaging and trying to work out um, what people are using. And Responders Lockdown Browser is quite common. And then there's some on the auto live track, which is the ProctorU, um, and Respondents Monitor um, and Examity. And then there was also questions about also authoring and delivery and alternative assessment. I won't really have time to dip into that and that's something that we could talk about later, but at, in this particular project we were focusing more on the, on the proctoring side. Okay, and then after that we, um, we started also listing how the actual product vendors related to these different services. So you would see the main thing to note there is that some of them also use third party services, so it's maybe not their main um, focus, and then they might actually um, link to another service for certain, certain of these features. 
And um, there are certain ones that focus specifically on, say, verification only, like learner verified. And then in the, back to the survey, we also asked um, academics in terms of what types of constraints that they see as the main, the main issues. So on the top, we have um, issues of integrity and identity. Again, um, the exam, the summative assessment is really high stakes. And so the red, the red indicators are essentially those types of questions. And um, the support and the design was also quite a high flagging issue. So people did, f academics did feel that they needed a lot more support and design. And then sometimes there were issues about making questions um, available according to their subject matter. It would either be difficult or, um, or not, not appropriate. And then the last one was more access. So devices, um, connectivity, lab space. Um, the digital skills weren't for the students, weren't so much of an issue. And policy um, limitations and expenses, they weren't that concerned with that at that stage. We do know that the costs can actually, in the live proctoring, can be quite um, problematic while for scaling. And then we also started looking then a bit about those challenges and possible strategies. And these probably, these have all been discussed in various spaces already, but like randomized question pools, more learner ver verified uh, strategies. Um, for the structural issues of um, la lack of lab space and such, um, we probably need to look into something like a bring your own device as alternative if we, if we wanted to pursue that. And then the assessment design, we'd, uh, we'd highlighted going into alternative assessment types, so um, portfolios, video settings, learner generated and creative assessments. So finally, um, so this is an evolving space. Every time we turned around, the, the vendors' pages were changing. So um, they're, they're, they're bringing out new features. They're changing things as the, it goes. Um, and it's quite competitive. So we kind of see this emerging as like a spectrum of solutions. And there might be the remote versus the automatic proctoring. Um, and the automatic proctoring might be easier to scale for certain like class tests or something um, versus a remote might work better for other uh, more niche scenarios. And then there's still the question about the traditional exam venues and um, building up a network of those because there is also yeah, various solutions that need to be looked into. Um, this was one one of the vendors um, outline of different types of, that's, that's a spectrum of solutions that are available. And then we also want to highlight then again, looking at alternative assessment. That will probably be a separate project, but I think that that's, it needs some investigation rather than leaving everything up to a high stakes exam. So our next phase for this pilot is to identify um, courses that are interested in piloting certain technologies and um, engaging in that. Yes. Okay, so we are a little over 11.45, but we'll take one or two questions quickly while the people get ready for the next session. I just wanted to add, so this is just really opening up the space. So I think that it's something a lot longer um, project and space. So if you want to chat about it afterwards, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. And thank you to our four or five presenters. Thank you to Suraj for facilitating that. Okay, so I think the next thing we are going into is institutional feedback. And um, Nicola, do you want to kick off? 
I've put your presentation up. All right, folks, so some of you might know me, some of you might not, <laughs> but I'm uh, Dr. Nicola Pallet, um, and I was at SILT for about the past five years, um, work, uh, working as an educational technology uh, lecturer and involved in the Emerge Africa project. And then this year, in February, I started working at Rhodes University in the Center for Higher Education uh, Research, uh, Teaching and Learning, CHIRTLE, um, more specifically in their educational um, technology unit. Okay, but I still have one foot in UCT. I'm involved, still involved with the Emerge Africa project and COCON being the facilitating online course. Um, for those of you who don't know Emerge Africa, <laughs> um, it's an online professional development network for educational technology practitioners and researchers in African higher education. Um, it's completely free, so check it out, emergeafrica.net, and you can join us. Um, and Emerge is a project uh, based in SALT that's funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Okay, so at Rhodes University, we use Moodle. UCT, we have Sakai. Um, so I have a foot in two open source um, LMSs at the moment. Um, and while we aren't using any Aperio products currently at Rhodes University, I thought I'd share what options we might um, be considering uh, using after the fascinating presentations that we've had um, yesterday, especially. And um, yeah, so moving between these two open source LMSs has really got me thinking about the different types of institutions and the kinds of technologies that we can and should be supporting um, with context, sustainability, scale, and capacity in mind. Um, because there, I mean, you can imagine, it's very different, Rhodes and, and UCT. And yeah, and there's, I think there's, there's no one size fits all approach, um, but at the end of the day, we need to be responsive to the local needs um, as they emerge uh, in our context. So with context in mind, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about Rhodes University. Okay, so that was just, sorry, that was about the two different, so this is what our LMS looks like at Rhodes, and this is just a snapshot from our online course. Some of you are very familiar with this picture. <laughs> okay, so Rhodes University is a small university of just over 8,200 students and 350 permanent academic staff. Uh, located in Grahamstown, uh, re recently renamed to uh, Makanda. Uh, it's a rural small town in the Eastern Cape. Interesting fact that this is actually uh, where the internet in South Africa started. Okay. Um, but back to the university. So 30% of students are postgraduates and 18% are international students from 54 countries from around the world. 70% um, of all students are black African students. Um, and while the student demographics have shifted, 
Um, the staff profile, uh, slightly less so, but getting there. Transformation is very big on the agenda. Um, Rhodes has, I was fa fascinated to discover that they actually have the best pass and graduation rates compared to any other South African um, university. And a student success rate of 84%. Yeah, so that that was quite impressive. I was like, wow, this is quite. But I mean, given given its size compared to other universities, I think it's it's quite. Um, one can see how that is possible. Um, in terms of research, there are 102 NRF-rated researchers, 15 Saatchi chairs, and the university boasts that the best uh, they have the that they have the best research output per academic staff member. There are three pillars um, of academia at Rhodes. It's teaching and learning, research, as well as community um, engagement. And there's a very big emphasis on making the university uh, more accessible uh, to the community and more responsive to the social context. Um, our uh, Rhodes uh, Vice Chancellor, Siswe Mabazela, has noted that um, the future and sustainability of the university is very much bound up in the challenges um, and the future and sustainability of Grahamstown as a town. So rather than being a university in the town, they're very big on the university working towards the development and improvement uh, of life in, uh, for the town and working with uh, community partners. Okay. So some of you might know this about Rhodes University and all the droughts that we've been having in Grahamstown. <clears throat> so that is our, just a picture of a poster of the dam levels 2015 compared to last year. I mean, there are, moment, there, there are days you'll open the taps, there'll be, there'll be no water. Um, not, not every day. Okay, but there are there are days. Um, so I think that there are advent uh, adventures. Yes, there are adventures too. But advantages and challenges of a town that shaped um, that have shaped the development of uh, the university. Um, the infrastructure and resources uh, of the town cannot support more face-to-face -face students, uh, given such challenges, and therefore e-learning is one of the only ways to really increase uh, enrollments, especially at postgraduate level. So government has been putting a lot of pressure on the university to increase its student numbers despite local challenges um, such as this. Um, our new IDP mentions e-learning specifically in relation to the objective of providing a wider reach um, for formative degrees and programs through e-learning. So uh, the unit supports a range of technologies. So are you connected is the Rhodes instance of Moodle. I think they're on, we're on 4.1. Um, like a lot of you, we're also using Turnitin, uh, the Google Suite, um, Camtasia, and Vivo for research. And um, something else we have is an e-portfolio platform, uh, which is a customized instance of Mahara called Are You Flexive? Yeah, okay. That's what our sign-on page looks like. Um, I said it's, <clears throat> it's very stable, but once you log in, um, it's quite quite vanilla, it looks like most, most Moodle sites. It's just the sort of sign-on page, it looks like that. Okay, we also have an educational technology policy with particular strategic, with strategic goals. Um, I've highlighted some of the most important um, sort of aspects, uh, but it does provide some clues as to how the alignment of the new IDP, which is a, um, seen to be responsive, sort of how the edtech strategy sort of builds, you know, there, there's a very good alignment between the two. Um, but build, building staff expertise and institutional capacity is really key. So yesterday we had Shakena's keynote on unbundling, and I think when I looked at this again through with having that in mind, it, it was quite interesting um, because we discussed yesterday some of the tensions involved with the different different stakeholders. Um, so we see words here like internal provision, external uh, partners. 
care. So we've also got an interesting Teaching with Technology uh, a booklet that provides case studies of what some of the staff who participated in a recent uh, the Teaching and Learning Showcase um, have been doing. The case studies foreground pedagogical approaches and learning designs rather than celebrating particular um, technologies in isolation. Um, I would say that uh, the pedagogy first perspective um, has really helped with the promotion of appropriate technological responses. So while, does not, while Rhodes does not have you know, large-scale le lecture capture and things like that, there is actually a growing use of and interest in um, lecture videos and podcasts. There are quite a few lecturers uh, using those. So I've identified some priority areas based on my own um, experiences at Rhodes University so far uh, and conversations with academic staff and students. Um, currently, lecturers uh, share large video files uh, via Google Drive um, to their uh, Google Drive folder on their course sites. So that's how students access their videos. They don't always um, convert these into smaller file sizes. Um, which, of course, is not very good for students data-wise. Um, obviously, this is not ideal. Um, the LMS is also hosted on a local server and susceptible to downtime when there is uh, load shedding in the zero-rated URLs of network providers, which we know is quite common uh, practice during times of student protests, uh, do not include Google Drive and YouTube, which lecturers are currently using. So we've got to look at... Um, you know, getting those kind of things into the LMS. Um, yeah, yesterday, Stephen spoke about the benefits and the challenges of a cloud service. So this, this is something that I thought you know, really resonated with me. Um, it also means that students would be able to access their course sites uh, via mobile when there is no electricity, if you use uh, a cloud server instead of a local server. Um, and I think this is something Rhodes University will need to consider in the future. Um, in conversations with lecturers, they also reported things like that the LMS was about the LMS that was they found off-putting, um, being able to favorite course sites. Um, it's a feature that is more that you see in more recent versions of Moodle. Most folks running the latest version of Sakai already have that. Um, some mentioned scroll fatigue, so uh, the newer versions of Moodle have a tool, it's also called Lessons, but it's very much like Sakai Lessons. There's a big need for that. Um, and that, these are things that will be better for mobile as well. Um, but some needs don't have an easy technological fix. Um, and I think it's about a change in practice, and this takes much longer to grow. So a software upgrade uh, is easy. And, um, you know, I think upgrading skills is a lot harder than upgrading software. And I'd like to uh, encourage fellow attendees uh, to think about these in tandem. Because for each new technology that you upgrade, um, new tool that, you, uh, tool that you introduce or upgrade or deploy, you've also got to think about how you implement um, your staff development approaches. Sometimes it's good to support or to do a few things first and to focus on them and to do them well, uh, rather than have too many things. Some presenters have mentioned sort of staff resistance at their institution. And I think it wasn't until today that folks have been talking about staff development, especially the SALT colleagues who presented um, earlier. So as an ed tech person who is also positioned as an academic uh, developer, um, I really want to highlight this. I also think uh, we need to interrogate the link between technological access and epistemological access, um, knowing, being, doing, what this means for students as well as our as staff. Um, yeah, and linking back to, to Michelle's presentation, I think because of the big emphasis on community engagement at Rhodes University, uh, we'll definitely be thinking about OERs and ways to share knowledge resources beyond the university. So whichever media library tool we choose, whether we're going to go open Aquila or open cost or whatever, 
could be even Moodle video. Um, that's something that we're going to need to to be thinking about. Is can it be shared beyond the walled garden um, of the university? Okay. Oh. And then some other things that we've been thinking about. So we're getting a mobile app for our Are You Connected? And um, because we know access inequality is, is very large among students and we want to introduce more um, flex op op opportunities for flexible learning. Um, there's a lot of interest as well in online supervision because if we're going to have grow our uh, postgraduate uh, student base and do that in a way that's online, this is going to be quite essential. Um, another area is online facilitation. Currently, the majority of lecturers are using the LMS in a very sort of content uh, delivery way. And I've just launched uh, with my colleague, Nompilo Chuma, a blended and online teaching and learning uh, seminar series. Um, so, yeah. And to quick, quick little advert is that uh, Rhodes University will be hosting the National Teaching and Learning Conference Haltasa uh, this year. Uh, the call for papers will go out soon, so uh, keep your eye on that. And then facilitating online, if anyone's keen to join us, uh, here's the information. Cool. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, and uh, we start, yeah. Um, right, Molueni, uh, Molueni, Ninjani, Ninjani, Smipilile, yeah, yeah, got you by surprise there. We're not expecting that one. Um, my name is Lubabalu Padi, uh, and I'll be co presenting with my colleague, uh, Kone. Uh, we're just um, uh, giving feedback, basically, on UCT, what we've been doing in the past year since uh, Northwest. And uh, before we start, I'd like to introduce you to my team, our team, um, the Learning Technologies team at UCT. Uh, we form part of SILT, the Center for Innovation in Learning and Technology at UCT. And uh, uh, you've seen these people. Uh, earlier in the conference, and a special welcome to to our newbies, uh, Aaron Tabede and uh, Rai. Uh, Rai couldn't join us today, but he was here yesterday. Um, basically, the Learning Technologies team at UCT, what we really do is um, we provide support on a range of uh, uh, educational technologies, and uh, Vula being one of them. Uh, Vula is... Uh, our Sakai instance, so we've, we've skinned it and called it Vula, which means open. Um, and also, we provide support on uh, Adobe Connect, Lecture Capture, uh, Turn It In, just to name a few. Um, we also collaborate a lot with Insult, uh, with the, uh, the course and curriculum development team, and also the staff development team uh, on a number of projects there. Um, I'll just be highlighting a few um, interesting numbers on how we've been using Vula and um, over the past year, uh, well, 
over the past year and over the past few years. As you can see here, we're currently running uh, our 12X uh, Sakai uh, version. And if you take a look on your, well, on your left, as you can see, that, that's our user, a number of users over the years. And you can see that uh, our student numbers have actually grown over the years. And uh, maybe it's because lecturers have decided to use Vula or students actually force them to use Vula. Um, uh, but you'll notice that also um, with the guest accounts, that's also increased. Uh, this is partly due to be it an increase on uh, short courses that UCT provides, and certain departments use Vula uh, to support that uh, uh, the blended learning approach in those courses. Uh, you will see the staff contingency remains more on a straight line there. Uh, on the right hand side, well, my right hand side, uh, you will see the different types of sites we have there. Um, at UCT, we allow students to create project sites, so um, be it for uh, project work or collaboration work, so students can create their own project sites. Uh, you can see also the number actually has been increasing, uh, which is positive, that's good for us. Um, also, the increase on cost sites there, you can see that uh, the uptake and um, academics using Vula more. And if you take a look more around about 2017, you can see that's where it started picking. Maybe it's because of the shutdowns, I don't know. But uh, it's quite interesting. Um, yeah, uh, as I mentioned, we provide support on Vula and sometimes training sessions. And uh, these are just our numbers, as you can see there. So our training mainly focuses on a number of things, just basic intro to Vula, uh, and also tool-specific training like lessons, um, uh, cost evaluation, grade book and assessment, and uh, mainly tests and quizzes. Um, as also, if you take a look on the chart that we have, you'll notice that the, the, the busiest time is, of course, beginning of, uh, beginning of term. Uh, it's quite high there, so uh, with the new students and people setting up courses and so on, uh, we get a lot of emails. And uh, in terms of uh, the support that we provide, we, we provide support, be it face-to-face -face when people pay us a visit, even though we don't uh, like visits, but people do pay us a visit. Um, uh, mostly, <laughs> mostly, mostly we, we deal with email support. Uh, where people would send a, uh, uh, an email to our help uh, mailbox, and uh, we track that using Jira, uh, which is a, a project tracking uh, software. Uh, so when someone sends an email, it sits there, and my teammates would claim the call and would respond to it. And that's how we keep track to our, track on those calls. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, when we also collaborate with with Insult, and now and then we get special uh, invites to to the NAP. Uh, NAP means a uh, new academic practitioner's program. So we, we go and uh, advocate and uh, try and encourage new academics to, to use tech and, and ways in which they could use it and think about using it. Yeah. Um, what am I leaving out? Yeah, and this is, I thought I should just highlight this. This is another application that we, we use quite a lot at UCT. Um, turn it in. And some of the highlights over the past year is that um, uh, we've got 99% of the uh, submissions done in 20, 2018 were done uh, via cost sites. Uh, over the years, um, we've decided to design faculty-based uh, Vula sites specifically for masters and PhD students because as a requirement, or when they submit their, their thesis, they need to have a tenant and report signed by them and their supervisor. So we do have dedicated sites across faculties for masters and PhD students. Um, and also, as you can see here, we do also provide direct access, but most of the time, uh, users interact with tenant in via uh, uh, the Vula integration. So um, most of the time, uh, they would do it via cost sites. Uh, but there are special cases where a lecturer maybe would want to submit on behalf of the student or whatsoever. Then um, 
um, as you can see, that we create direct accounts for them, but we don't create direct accounts for students to turn it in. Um, we've had some challenges over the years and also some special requests basically from academics. And uh, well, the special request from academics and we haven't had answers to that is, is that uh, uh, academics would like to use Tenedin for their own publications and research and so on, but because of our licensing agreement with Tenedin, we can't allow them to use, uh, we can't allow them to use the platform Tenedin. However, Tenedin has another platform called Authenticate, so we do always refer them to that. But uh, it leaves a lot of unhappy academics because they now need to buy credits because we don't have licensing for that. Um, and also another interesting challenge that actually it was not really a challenge for us only, but it was also a challenge for Tenedin. It got them by surprise. Um, that we couldn't we experienced last year that with most uh, thesis submissions that if someone submitted a uh, their thesis exceeds 20, 200 pages, uh, it was difficult to generate a report, like the reach text report that they would download when they, well, it, it could generate it, but it, they couldn't download the report, uh, which left a lot of unhappy students, of course, there. Uh, but a, a workaround to that was we had to now tell them that they needed to convert that or needed to view the report in a text view format, which was not so nice. And, you know, yeah, but that's just one of the challenges. I think Tenedin is still looking into this also. They haven't really figured it out. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'll now be, okay, I thought I was going to hand over to you. Yeah, uh, right, okay, this is, I think this is my last slide. Um, this is another service that we provide support on, and it's slowly growing, you know, people are picking up and they're seeing the importance of uh, uh, video conferencing. And um, yeah, so as you can see, it's grown over the years, and uh, Tenedin had the uh, biggest number of uh, rooms created. Um, and I know our biggest user, I think it's uh, the Emerge uh, Africa team, uh, they use it quite a lot and also some guys in, the, in health sciences. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's basically it, and I'll be handing over to Kone for the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Luca Okay. Cool. Okay, so um, in terms of lecture capture, uh, Stephen did a very good workshop the day before yesterday, I think. Yeah. Um, we've seen a steady increase in the number of lecture series, um, and that kind of corresponds to how we expanded and um, added venues. And we've seen also increase in published recordings and scheduled recordings, so that's good. And if you remember last year, um, when I when Sam and I did our talk, um, I mentioned that we just crossed the 40,000 recordings published threshold. So that was last year. And we are on 55,000 <laughs> at the moment. So I took this, this screenshot like minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Um, real yeah, almost real time. Uh, you can see the, the breakdown in where most of the recordings go. Science is very big, um, commerce, EBE. Um, and then we've seen a growth in like the unassigned. Um, so this is like conferences and personal series and stuff. So this is interesting. Um, so what we've done, uh, we upgraded to version 6 in December. Uh, we had some performance issues which we solved during that time. Um, you will probably not remember this, but last year we didn't have a database server. We now have a separate database server. We added a new worker node. Um, and then most of the work we did last year was to increase reliability. Um, so the 301516 is 30 
recordings or the, like 50% of our recordings basically fail because of our capture agents. Um, hard drive issues, CMOS battery, power issues, something like that. Um, and then 15, the next one is audio issues. Like the lapel mic wasn't properly on or it's off or something weird happened in the room itself. And then the 16 is miscellaneous kind of things. Stuff we can't really control as such. So we started to implement a, back, a, a fallback recorder. So that takes the feed directly from the camera instead of taking it from the capture agent, which is somewhere in this thing. Um, we can still essentially get a recording even though this fails. So that's that, that idea. And then the audio channels, we can um, we record the lapel mic, like I'm doing like the one I'm wearing, but we also record the room mics. Um, and then we save those as different channels. And in post-processing, we can choose which one we want to use. So let's say that a power mic's battery fails, this will drop, but those will be fine. And that'll give us a consistent audio signal. Um, and then we implemented the personal series for the One Button Studio and clinical skills. Um, Nawal explained that quite nicely. Um, and then end of last year, well, second semester, we uh, implemented an opt-out policy. So instead of lecturers setting up their recording with our welcome to lecture recording tool, which I showed last year, um, the opt-out, essentially, we give them uh, a choice before the start of the semester. And if they do not choose to, then they get scheduled automatically. It's like everything is scheduled according to your timetable. And as your timetable changes, it adapts and changes it itself. But that caused a 17% increase in scheduled recordings. Um, we haven't done the numbers for this semester yet, but I suspect it's a little bit higher than that. Um, and then we also implemented a captioning for IBM Watson and Nibity, which is Way With Words. Um, and we're running pilots on those to see how useful and, and, and accurate it is. Okay. Sorry. So, an overview. We upgraded Sakai to 12 in June last year. Uh, we did an open cost upgrade in December last year. Uh, we're still running lecture site, uh, track 4 k um, We Im implemented the automatic trimming that I discussed last year as well, so that detects speech and silences in a recording, and then automatically trims the recording to the start and end. Uh, we're still running Tsugi. Zerti, turn it in, like Luba Bala discussed. Um, we're running a Canvas online platform pilot, which you could talk to Sakena about, which she's not here. Oh, there she is. Um, and then we're running SAP's business objects in terms of like statistics on our learning analytics kind of thing. Um, so in future, in the next year, we plan to upgrade to Sky 19, um, open cost 7. Um, we're doing the capturing pilot. Um, we're expanding the automatic trimming. At the moment, it's only available in, I think, 10 venues. Um, so out of the 118 that we have, we will expand the number of venues. Um, and then we're implementing a storage retention cycle. So we <laughs> estimate by, what, 2020? we will have 225 terabytes of space um, in terms of usage. So we need to implement a retention cycle to just like manage that. Um, and then we're slowly moving all our servers over from Slays to Ubuntu. Um, we're looking at a H5P pilot, uh, which you can talk to Sam about if you're interested. Um, we're looking at the Blackboard Alley integrations, and then we're going to do learning analytics next year. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Learning analytics using OnTask. 
and learning our code warehouse. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was saying this is a pug boot bow. Pug boot bow. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. everyone. <laughs> okay, some feedback from the NWU. We've had an interesting year in the sense that we've gone through a restructuring process, just as a bit of background. Um, from 15 faculties spread over three campuses, we now have eight faculties still spread over the three campuses, but we had like two faculties of law on different campuses, and they've merged now. So that had a huge impact on lots of things, and I'll, um, I'll just mention that as I go along. Since last year, if we look at the Ifundi or Sakai environment at the NWU, we've upgraded to version 12.2. We did the assignment marker development that Silly um, showed you earlier on. We had a huge project um, the, doing elections. And um, we also have a growth in users. I think last year we had all our um, s modules already in sites on, in our Sakai environment. But what happened last year is that we, open distance learning environment, um, which was really managed by an outside company called OLG. The contract with them has stopped, so we have been merging lots of those students over into our Ifundi. So they started using that as well. Other teaching and learning projects that are keeping us real busy is we have um, classroom projects. As part of the restructuring, um, the IT department got the electronic division department and also looking after classrooms, which was not an IT function before July last year. So that had quite a big impact on us. Um, the classroom, we also got the DHET money. So for the next three years, we are looking at upgrading our classrooms. Um, which I think is going to be a huge project. We've started learning that already. We also did for the first time electronic lecturer evaluation since last year, which went very well, but we also had lots of issues with that, and Gerda is the one um, handling that project. Um, actually busy with the first round of this year at the moment. Lecture capturing, we also upgraded the end of last year to version six. In our environment, we haven't really increased the number of lecture rooms. So we've been, um, I don't think we've moved in that area as well as we would have liked to. And I think we'll be doing a re-evaluation on what we do in that area this year. The open distance learning people have not been part of our open cost lecture capturing. They've been using Panopto. So we have, and now moving closer together in the new structure, we have a lot of issues in that area to also sort out. Probably be able to give you more detail on that next year. We have had one button, A, uh, no, two, one button studios on our Vol campus for quite a few years now, but not as fully integrated as the ones that, as UCT explained earlier on. And you would have learned from the questions asked from our colleagues on this side that they were very interested in what you do. But um, it's not integrated into our Sakai environment at this stage. It's a loose service on that campus, and um, we also are developing or 
equipping one in Poch at this stage and also on our Mafeking campuses. So that's something growing and will be growing in the next year. Then we've had um, a phenomenon, really. Now, you'll figure out that I'm from the IT department and not from the CTLs as most of the other speakers were. So it's a bit of an IT focus, this. But we work in close collaboration with our um, CTL team. With the UCDP grants that some lecturers receive, they start projects in, um, with a technology focus. And then they go a while and then they start asking questions about how are we going to roll this out and how is this going to and where is it going to be hosted and whatever. So we've had quite a few of those and we were working with one or two um, lecturers actually implementing those. Now they are a bit small scale stuff in some cases but I would like to just show you the one on dashboards and where we also plan on integrating with on task with them. Is, this is a dashboard per site and only for one or two modules, very much in a um, proof of concept phase at this stage, where from the grade book in Sakai, a dashboard similar to this is created, um, where you can, lecturers can set this up as they would like to, say what the marks are, which should be green, blue, yellow, and so on. But typically, the red ones would be um, the problem students on the one line and the problem assignments or tests or whatever they were on the other side. And then the plan is to feed this into something like on task so that students can get messages on what their situation is at the certain point. Only really in a beginning phase. It was a good opportunity for us to just start playing with the data and see what we can do there. And then the SEC elections that we ran last year, we are also helping them this year to do that. Um, it's a project that we started doing in Sakai with tests and quizzes. And with the proof of concept, everything went really smooth. It was small and it was... Not, not a political thing at all. It was only one portfolio. So people were very excited about what, what it could bring to the table without spending a lot of money on fancy um, voting systems and so forth. This is more or less what it looks like. Also one running at the moment. On the landing page, just an example of all the students with links to everything they have to say. And then a normal test and quiz where they can choose who they want to vote for, more questions if there's more portfolios. So really very simple, but it ended up in being a really massive project. When we got to campuses where politics was a big thing, um, we had to explain to auditors where what goes and who can see what and things like that. So that was an interesting experience. Um, in the end, it went very well. And also, we had a few crises even with Sakai, and we were really thankful for the help from the UNISA at that stage. Okay, our big projects for the, years, for the year to come is we'll be doing an upgrade again. We don't have the risk appetite that UCT has because we're not going to 19 this year. We're going to stick to a newer version of 12. Um, assessments also a very high priority with us. I'm thankful for the report that Sam has made available. I think that will be a very good kickstart for ours. Um, broadcasting of lectures with the alignment over campuses of all academic work is also on our table. We want to do a bit of archiving of old sites and a cleanup of content. We have been, we haven't given it enough attention to that over the years. We have also a DHET funded or partly funded by DHET project on virtualization. So we want to see if we can save money on, well, shift money really. It won't probably be less expensive, but to um, help 
get software as they are in the labs at the moment onto student devices and in the labs, of course. Um, so we're also excited to see what that can do in the assessment space. I think that will be part of the um, tests that we do. And then I've heard a, a bit of short course um, comments also in the past in the past two days, and um, there's a big drive for short courses. There, there are lots of short courses, um, but it's more driven by lecturers themselves or faculties. Now it's been more centralized and there's all sorts of issues around that. So that's one thing that we're also um, be involved in. And that's that from me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think I surprised even Elsby by asking for time to speak. <laughs> okay, so um, we all know that we've been involved with Sakai for quite a bit, but I thought maybe you could also do with a bit of an update of where Open Colab is at at this stage. So I think you've already seen this. Uh, a lot of people have spoken about this uh, the past day and a bit. All the work that Francois, Yaku, Bruce, and Detroit, who's not here, have been involved with. Uh, I take my hat off these, these guys. They have shifted a lot of work the past year. So congratulations, guys. Um, some people maybe we haven't directly worked with or done s as much with as some of the bigger people have been uh, Cubas Learning, APT, Sasha is here somewhere, and the Professional Golfers Association, which actually also runs a version of Sakai. Um, and we've got a few people that it's been a while that we've uh, engaged with them, which is UCT and UWC. And this year we also had a, what was it, LCB, a proof of concept, a prototype, uh, whatever, with the Durban University of Technology that evaluated uh, Sakai. Uh, we have also uh, attained some Moodle skills. It was through a partner, but that's why Detoy is not here, because he's now becoming our Moodle expert. Uh, so we've done Moodle for Digital Frontiers Institute, um, Ackermans, Rad8, ICPCN, and Attain. Some of those projects are still in implementation phase. Then <coughs> again, on the Aperio side, the CAS stuff, Francois, again, dug into CAS, and I think he is now the local expert. We can all agree on that. And I'll speak a bit more about this product of ours, but um, we also use CAS in that. And then we've been exploring a relationship with Urkund as a, as a potential alternative to Turnitin, specifically focused on our maybe smaller clients, less uh, affluent than some of the major universities. Uh, but that's not all we did this year. We also did a few other things. Uh, which was around our enroll solution, which is our own uh, solution. So we implemented that at Agri-Colleges. Cornerstone Institute is busy implementing it. And then again at the Digital Frontiers Institute uh, that is implemented. That was chop chop, we had to do it. Paul and I arguing how long it took. I'm saying 2.5, he's saying 2.75 months, but yes, that's fine. Um, we also deliver outsourced solutions to Northwest around their student information system, their financial system. 
did a bit of work in the DSpace and open journal system space, and then um, working with the Coventry University on a research participation app that we built for them. But that one is sort of hanging because of the GDPR rules that is holding us back currently. So I thought to also give you a bit of an update or an overview of the lifetime of Open Collab. So this year, the company and all its versions, I'll get to the versions, would have existed, for, well, it exists for 20 years. This is our 20th year. Um, so we're feeling pretty chuffed about that. <laughs> 20 more to come. I won't live that long, but hey, we'll make it. So in version one of the company, we were literally focused on very few clients. We were an outsource. Purely outsource. You give us the project, we do it, we give it back. If you're nice to us, we'll support it. But that was pretty much the uh, business model. Then in version two, I think we managed to get a few more clients. <laughs> uh, still outsource development, but got involved with Sakai uh, alongside Northwest UCT and UNISA. Version three, that's quite recent. I'll ex well, version four is the most recent, but so over from 2011 to around now, we've increased, well, 18 months ago, we increased our client base to about 34. We're still in outsource development. We still do Sakai. And we dabbled a bit with what is called the Koali open source community. Um, that didn't quite work out for a variety of reasons that we don't have the time for right now. But I think somehow that also forced us into Open Colab 4.0. Uh, so 4.0, I suppose if I have to put a timeline on it, 18 months ago we decided we can do this. I'll tell you why we thought we could do this. We're still doing outsource development. We're still supporting Sakai. We have a product of our own called Enroll, which is student management information system, but we're trying to put a different spin on it. And then we're also trying to build out a platform called ajourney.openpolab, which I'll speak about a bit more. So getting to version four, and many of you are part of our story, and you've been an, uh, an enabler of our story, and we are really, really chuffed that we could have uh, learned so much from you, and we can use it as a company to also move forward. So when we sort of sat back to 18 months ago, oh, what can we do? Um, we said, well, we can develop software. We actually have a bucket load of experience in post-secondary education. And we do actually like this open source thing. We've learned a lot from it in the sense of how to collaborate um, and not just commercialize and take over the world. Um, our main offerings are student admin systems at this stage. So most of our income historically has come from that part of our offering. Uh, teaching and learning is in a good second place. Bespoke development, yeah, it's also that one, give it to us, we'll get, do it, the work, get it back to you. And then a bit of a distant cousin still is, is research. So taking all of that, knowing what we know, we thought, let's do this version four thing. So that is, I think, a good thing. We've upgraded ourselves in true software style over the years. Some, sometimes it takes a bit longer, but we're uh, truly chuffed that we're on 20 years. So next year, when we're 21, yeah, we'll have a big party. You're all invited. Okay, so um, without having consulted the guys, but we spoke about this a while back, uh, not a while back, the other day. Um, if we look at uh, what we just like to call learn at Open Colab these days, so what is it that we want to specifically in this community focus on this year? So what I've heard here this past few days is the concerns that maybe Sakai is not your tool of choice. I would really like to urge everyone to go back and, and just articulate your own issues with it. Because from my understanding, everything isn't the platform. The platform isn't necessarily always the problem. So before you throw the baby out with the bathwater, just do that assessment. Because there is much that we can help you with to make it better if it isn't what you want. But I'm also thinking there's a lot of stuff it does that maybe you're not utilizing very well. So we were also quite keen to get into OnTask and Tsugi. And I, personally, I have a long list. But if I say that to the guys, oh, I get the what? Um, but which I can also understand. So um, our journey platform really is tr 
trying to, and we only started out with it like last year somewhere, maybe it was the year before that at the end, is to try and build something that is a, a seamlessly integrated package of stuff, tools, that will just serve student engagement much better. You've all spoken about it, how do we engage our students better? For us, it's not just about the learning management platform or learning, it's also about are they giving, having a good uh, administrative experience, when they register, when they enroll, when they pay, is it good for them? Uh, few people used the word frictionless uh, yesterday. That is actually a brilliant word, because when your student struggles with stuff that they shouldn't be struggling with, you're taking away from their time to, to learn. So in this thing, what are we hoping that we can do? And we're also trying to focus on the, uh, focus on the African context. We have found a lot of um, African institutions cannot, and I'm not talking UCT or Northwest or that's whoever, uh, a few other guys are struggling to afford uh, the bigger solutions, keep them working and make them work. Uh, so what we would putting in there, and what we have started, doing not too badly, is our own product, Enroll, and we've included uh, Moodle, we've included Sakai, um, we've definitely integrated with some third-party products, so smaller financial systems, we've integrated with one of our clients uses Desire to Learn Brightspace, we've done that, integrated with Google, and the team can give you our long list of things that are already done, but I suppose part of the platform is that we will provide you an integration too many tools of your choice that you're already subscribing to. We're also aware of the fact that not everybody wants a hosted solution, so we'll provide a, and we're already providing a few options there, and I think something we sort of have in our minds, but maybe it's a bit far off so, is a place where we can really accommodate uh, EdTech developers in Africa. We all know that we do special things here in Africa. So how do we facilitate bringing in those specific things into our ecosystem? So th that's our main thinking. It's a whole topic all on its own. Uh, lots of work still to be done. But um, yeah, that's where we're at, version four of OpenCoder. Thank you for all your support. Without them, 
I was saying to Stephen last night, this is the first year we've had a virtual presentations with no interruptions. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Lunch outside. Thank you very much for attending. Safe travels. We'll see you again. Wait, sorry, wait, wait. Next year is at WITS. I forgot to say that. And then the other thing is all the presentations, the URLs will be made available.